When looking upon the way that religion is treated in modern society, it is often important to track its development and its genealogy through different thinkers. And we can kind of approach these sort of like paradigms like Thomas Kuhn talked about them. There are these paradigms where a mode of thinking is preferable and then there's a paradigm shift and it shifts. Now, many people view non-religious people or atheists as being particularly intolerant and in fact persecuting believers through, for example, the way religion was treated in places like the Soviet Union. And many people will kind of, their first introduction to Marx is looking up the religion is the opium of the masses or whatever quote. And in fact, it is important if we want to understand people like Marx's view towards religion. And, you know, Marx is all about created communism. He's about communal responsibility, communal being, and he thinks that maybe God is a bit antithetical to that ideal. And if we want to trace exactly why Marx views this way, typically we think we have to go to Hegel, right? Because Hegel is the biggest inspirer of Marx. If you read the Phenomenology of Spirit, there are moments where you're like, oh yeah, I can see where Marx read this and it just like feels like communism opening up. Hegel has a lot of ideas of rationality as a historical unfolding of itself and that rationality is this guiding teleological force carrying things through their contradictions and sublating them and bringing them to this realized form as absolute spirit. And when one reads Hegel you get quite perplexed. I did a lecture on a essay I wrote called This Atheist is a Lutheran, which is about Hegel and precisely talking about the profound split there is within Hegel about what religion even means. One has, at the very least, the very immediate response that Hegel's conception of religion is very different from like evangelical Christianity or something. And at the time of first reading Hegel, I thought this was particularly radical. And maybe it is, but we can certainly see that there are certain kind of mystic traditions and just other religions that aren't like evangelical, evangelical Christianity or like kind of your mainstream Judaism. Like there are lots of other different conceptions of religion, and it is interesting to see how people like Hegel, with their philosophy, created a way towards secular humanism. And this secular humanism is embodied in the philosophy of Ludwig Feuerbach. And in he kind of did two works. He has the essence of Christianity and he has the essence of religion. I'm going to do a video on both, but I want to do the one on the essence of Christianity first. Now, Ludwig Feuerbach is an immediate, uh, he comes immediately after Hegel, and he clearly is a Hegelian in the essence of Christianity. Now, 10 years later, when he writes the essence of religion, he definitely wants to back up from Hegel, and he, in fact, gives some wonderful critiques of Hegel that feel very dialectical materialist, kind of, not even that so much as just a, re a rejection of the dialectical method as being absolved of responsibilities that it has yet to do. And in the essence of Christianity, Feuerbach does something very interesting, and partially this is because Feuerbach is not only a philosopher, but he's an anthropologist. And you'll see this a lot more in the essence of religion, where he's going to analyze all these various traditions to basically explain what is the impetus behind this. He's almost trying to look at religion, and in this sense Christianity, from the outside, and he's trying to explain, okay, there are these broad themes inside 
and what exactly are they trying to bring out? Now, Feuerbach sees great usefulness in a lot of the things pregnant within the Christian narrative, especially the emphasis on love in the absolving of sin. But of course, he doesn't think that this should be taken too far to personalize and realize the divine being as something independent of humanity. So we're going to analyze this very, very short work where Feuerbach basically evolves the Hegelian split with regards to what is religion in the Hegelian system and gives it a properly left-wing Hegelian reading in a way that is going to pave the way for a humanity-focused take on ethics and teleology. At the end of the preface, Feuerbach lays out quite clearly his attitude towards the transcendent. He says, religion is the dream of the human mind, but even while dreaming, we are not in heaven or in the realm of nothingness. We are right here on earth in the realm of reality. Even if we see real things, not as they really are and as they must necessarily be, but in the enrapturing light of wishful imagination. Hence, I do nothing more to religion than to open its eyes, or rather, to direct its inwardly turned gaze toward what is outside, so that the object as it exists in the imagination changes into what this object is in reality. And the key thing to note is that Feuerbach thinks that the religious impulse is a valid impulse, and he doesn't want to necessarily get past the impulse so much as explain what it is really trying to get at. And he thinks that religion is ultimately an emanation of the human mind. He says a little bit later, the religious object of adoration is nothing but the objectified nature of him who adores. Which is to say that, and this is a very common idea within even religious circles, that the yearning for God is deep within the human soul. And, I mean, Feuerbach is very quick to accept that. He says, yeah, of course, we see religions pop, pop up all over the place. But it's important to note that it is an adoration of something not outside oneself, but within oneself, present in reality, as he says. He goes on to say, the religious object therefore necessarily presupposes a critical judgment and a discrimination between the divine and the non-divine, between what is worthy and what is not worthy of adoration. And this is to say that, of course, religion exemplifies that which we adore. And this, funnily enough, is actually not too far off from the religious thinking of someone like Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson has had a very interesting kind of character arc, so to speak, in the scholarly and in the public square. At first, he was kind of doing a, I don't know, structuralist, like union archetype kind of look at human relations and psychology. Not like particularly novel, I must say, but definitely like a not entirely ludicrous project to entertain, even if one is not a structuralist. But then he kind of, I don't know, he went down this hill real fast where all of a sudden he is a Jesus freak, as, as the as the song goes, the voice of the martyrs or whoever whoever did the song. And Jordan Peterson commonly, it was in an interview, someone asked, did the events in Exodus really happen? And he said something like, they're realer than real. They've always been happening. You might ask, well, did, did the events in Exodus really happen? And our conclusion was, well, not only did they, they happened in a, in a meta manner, they're still happening. They happened so, in, they happened with such reality that they haven't stopped happening. Which is a terribly unhelpful answer because 
I think it's deliberately evasive. We could call it like some fancy, like Heraclitian kind of like paradox, like, oh, you are and you are not. You step into the river and you do not. But I think he's being purposely facetious here. But when we actually get into the religious thought of someone like Jordan Peterson, he thinks God is that highest value which structures the values that we use to even do anything because he thinks to act is to be oriented towards something and to value it and thus you do it because you value it and the reason you value that is because you value something higher and the highest value is God and in the same sense Feuerbach says we have the subject here and the subject is terribly isolated by, for example, Kantian thinking that the subject is boxed in by perception and there is a world out here and one has access to this world, yes, and in Hegel so brilliantly shows through his master-slave dialectic, one must have a real world. That this totally gets rid of solipsism as a legitimate philosophical endeavor, by the way. We must have this other to make the subject exist as such, but that world is filtered through perception such that the subject is boxed off, so to speak. And as such, and I mean, this is even within Hegel's philosophy, exactly what this other becomes, this world that is outside of oneself, is in fact structured by the subject insofar as it appears to the subject only through perception. The world for the subject is equivalent to the perception of the world. We could say that perception is the objective world, so to speak, in Hegelian terms, insofar as it is only accessed through its reflection inside consciousness. And of course, consciousness, Bewusstseins becoming Selbstbewusstseins, consciousness becoming self-consciousness, is Hegel's big thing that he thinks al allows ontology to even exist at all. This life and death struggle here and this filtering through perception, these differences will gradually sublate themselves and will eventually get to absolute spirit, will it, where it will just be Geist reflecting upon itself. It will be Zemst Geist, so to speak, or absolute spirit, really. And what Feuerbach is saying here is not that off base insofar as he thinks that not only does the world structure perception, and in fact they would be equivalent to each other insofar as we only have access to this world through one's perception, but in fact because of that, because perception is the world, perception is in fact irrevocably tied to the subject. And as such, what this world comes to embody, in fact, tells us a lot about the subject. This is what Hegel thinks, because really Hegel's ontology is an insistence on tautology. He thinks that this difference between the subject and the world is only apparent. Really, all there is, is the one. And the one needs this difference in order to exist, but it sublates this difference such that it is the one qua one. Now, because of this way of thinking, ultimately, whenever we want to say anything about the world, if we're really being as truthful as possible in Hegel's sense, all we can say is the one is the one. If we want to say the one is difference, actually no, 
Hegel thinks the one is this sublated difference, this difference which is ultimately reduced to oneness, to perception, to the subject talking about the subject, talking about the subject, talking about the subject. This is kind of the interiority of Hegelian ontology. And because of this, the world can't be said to be the exterior world outside of the subject can't be said to be except in perception. And thus, perception is in fact dictated by values. What is worthy? So, Feuerbach is faced with this Hegelian ontology and he says, okay, if, if there's this insistence on tautology in the Hegelian ontology, then really this outside world, because it is only known as the subject's world, it actually tells us about the subject, the one who deems things worthy, the one who values. And as such, it tells us, in fact, a kind of yearning for this outside objective world. It embodies our desire, really, and this is a fundamental desire for Hegel, is to be an independent object. And Hegel thinks that's why we need this outside world to be an objective, real thing. Because without this thing, there is nothing to give one recognition and to make one real as an independent thing. But if that's the case, then in fact, really ontology is about a self-reflexive sort of desire. The outside world, the religious object of adoration, that which is adored as outside of oneself is nothing but the objectified nature of him who adores. It is the nature of this subject objectified, made outside of oneself as an object, but also because this is objectified in both senses of the words, objectified as in made object and objectified as well as reduced to object. And this is a big problem within Hegelian ontology, but he thinks that this gives us great pause with regards to religion as such. Now, Feuerbach thinks, like I said before, that just because the object of the impulse is invalid, he doesn't think that that means that the impulse itself is invalid. Things like love being objectified as a being outside of oneself is mistaken for him. But the idea that love itself is, is not negated, but in fact is shown to be something within man, within the subject, which in a way is kind of a nice, you know, it's a nice thought that love and all all the greatest things which we put onto God are in fact things which are within ourselves and thus now this is a self-help book and now we can just realize our potential and in that way this is why for example Engels after reading the essence of Christianity speaks of it as this this joyous like opening one's mind and you know everything has changed and now we can create the perfect communist society we can see why they would think that after reading this. But he says, for example, it does not follow that goodness, justice, and wisdom are illusions just because the existence of God is an illusion, nor would they have a claim on us merely because he existed. And it's important to note this, this idea that the existence of God is an illusion is precisely the idea of the independent exterior existence of God. For Feuerbach, God exists, but as it is said in the Bible, God is love. God is non, none other than the love which is within oneself, 
which is the result of one's values and what one deems worthy, reflected outside of oneself. So we can see that he is in fact kind of putting morality and love in values on our shoulders and recognizing where they're coming from. He's doing an anthropology, a science of man. He wants to figure out what is man by looking at what is man's emanations? What are his creations? And in fact, this is a lovely reversal of God creating man to man creating God. He says, man, this is the mystery of religion, projects his nature into objectivity and then makes himself an object of concern for this new subject, for this projection of his nature, which is exactly what we have here. The subject in his interiority, in his desire, and in fact in his necessity to have an other, makes that other what it is, because in fact he can have no access to that other except as a self-emanation, as a tautology of him talking to himself, so to speak. And thus the great paradox is that he objectifies God as something which is a subject for him to project his own nature onto. Now, to better hit home what Feuerbach is saying about God being a sort of self-emanation, is he wants to talk about how the religious impulse comes out of the need to surpass one's limitations. He talks about intellect and he says, Man cannot possibly believe in, imagine, suspect, or conceive of any other kind of intellect or intelligence than that which enlightens him and is active in him. He can only separate this intelligence from the limitations of his own individuality. In contrast to the finite mind, the infinite mind is therefore nothing but intelligence separated in thought from the limitations of individuality and corporeality. And that is to say that just like we had before, and I'm going to be using man throughout here simply because Feuerbach uses man. I'm aware that I think it's probably an antiquated way of talking about the, the, uh, the ambiguous, plural, informal kind of humankind, but we have man and his world and his interiority and his ability to talk about this exterior is limited by his interiority. He can only talk about this outside world in very definite ways, namely as a concept, as non-contradictory. And this is in fact, you know, these are real limitations on knowledge. And this impulse, this need to exteriorize oneself, in a sense, really to dominate, if we look at the master-slave dialectic of Hegel, this is a profound attempt to get outside of the limitations of one's knowledge. So one tries to get past these and exteriorize these limits through the negation of these limits. And he calls this really mankind, the finite mind. Now, if we think about what Hegel has to say, the other is in kind of the usual like thesis, antithesis, synthesis statement of Hegel's philosophy. The antithesis is the negation of the synthesis. And this negation drives becoming and drives change. So, this other is going to necessarily be described as that which man is not. Because by being what he is not, he can be completely outside 
of man and that's completely objective so when we start talking about god he is first off seen as the infinite mind which is to say this in is the negation of all these things and Feuerbach is clear to say later in this work that this is necessarily going to mean that God is contradictory and that he is really impossible to talk about because he's kind of the unconcept, the anti-concept. He is outside of conception. And this is often what we hear in religious philosophy of those upholding religions say that well, you know, your gripes about the Trinity, in fact, that's just the limitations of your ability to conceive of God. That doesn't mean he doesn't exist. And Feuerbach wants to say, precisely, this is all God's function is, is to externalize one's limits and to purposely go beyond these limits such that man can be assured of himself through his limits. And we can see this really as a form of divine sadomasochism that comes with the ascetic movement of resigning from sexual pleasures and just from gen generally earthly pleasures. You know, you don't drink, you don't have sex, you devote your time to religious devotion. In a sense, this is the narrowing of oneself that creates the infinite mind as such. He says a little bit earlier, he says, in proportion as God becomes more ideally human, the greater becomes the apparent difference between God and man. To enrich God, man must become poor. That God may be at all, man must become nothing. Which is to say, you know, the important thrust of the master-slave dialectic, of the need for this other, is that there needs to be genuine, real, an absolute difference here. That this needs to be completely independent of this, and thus they both have their self-certainty through recognition, through selbstbewusst signs. But Feuerbach points out that this necessarily means reducing man to nothing, which we can see exemplified in this focus on the limitations of groveling in this idea of, oh, I am a sinner, I am so finite, God, I cannot even begin to understand you. And this can go on to be deployed in a number of ways as a sort of really quite a calm reverence, but also this is, as Feuerbach kind of points out, a debasing of man, turning mankind into a nothing or tending towards nothing. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like saying man is the limit as he approaches nothing, right? That he is defined by his tending towards nothingness. And Feuerbach thinks that this is exactly the other way around because in fact, man is not nothing. Man is the given, the reality. And the emanation of this reality is, in fact, it is the limitation, and man is that which surpasses limitations collectively. And throughout the work, he's going to manifest this idea that, in fact, the limitations we place on ourselves are easily ones that can be surpassed through the collective works of mankind and thus an extreme emphasis on humanistic coming together and surpassing these limitations which impose upon man a limit towards nothingness or a tending towards nothingness. He goes on to say, God as God, that is God as a being which one can only think and which is an object only to the intellect is therefore nothing else than this intellect itself depicting itself in perfection as its own object. God is reason, declaring and affirming itself as the highest being. 
And this could just as well come straight out of Hegel and you probably wouldn't know that it was Feuerbach. Which is to say, he mentions God as God. And this is kind of, you know, when we're talking about, okay, what is a table? We can talk about table as wood, table as the plan to create the wood, the plan as, or the table as the telos, or the end to which it is. This is kind of Aristotle's four categories. I know there's one that, I'm, that I haven't got on here. There's the, the person who makes it, the maker. This is what Aristotle tries to do when he talks about ontology, about being that we talk about the table as wood and the table as the plan and the table as the end to which it serves and the table as the one who makes it. And that this unfolding of the table through its properties will tell us exactly what the table is. But Hegel's like, no, this is just talking about the table as other things. He wants to say, we need to talk about the table as table. and. Here, we're doing the same thing with God as God, which is to say God not as respect to his attributes or to his what he is not, to his negation. We're talking about God as God. And we can clearly see here that this is, this is man, like we've just been talking about. We could easily equate man as God, and we get exactly the same thing as before, that we're talking about God as God. And typically, this is the formula that man is in fact God. In fact, it's really just about God talking about himself. But in fact, Feuerbach wants to say that in fact, we use God to talk about man when in fact it's just man talking about man. And in this sense, when he's talking about God as God, he's talking about that which is an object only to its intellect, which is a tautology, right? It's an object only as its own object. It's not an object perceived from the outside, it's an object to itself. And this is Feuerbach insisting on the absurdity of talking about God if we're within a Hegelian framework, which is to say that God is not an exterior being. In fact, if we want to insist on the Hegelian framework, God is merely man talking about man. But this, this is ultimately what we're doing, but we're sort of, I don't know, using God as a, as a shortcut to talk about man and all his abilities as infinite, as beyond the concept, beyond limitations. And Feuerbach wants to say, no, let's just talk about man. This is sort of an insistence on reality itself. And in a sense, just like we talked about before in the intro, where Hegel says that reason is this teleological pushing force that is accelerating history and driving the dialectic, driving the becoming of the one, of absolute spirit, of God. Feuerbach is saying that God is just reason. God is this tautological talking about himself. And thus we can really see that God is man talking about man. In a way to just sum up this idea, he says, reason can only believe in a God who is in accordance with its own nature, as a God who is not beneath its own dignity, who on the contrary is a realization of its own nature, i.e. reason believes only in itself, in the absolute affirmation of its existence. What therefore do you affirm? What do you objectify in God? Your own reason. God is your highest idea, the highest conception of your intellect, the highest conception you can possibly have. 
what I recognize as belonging to the essence of reason I posit in God as existing. Which is to say, merely what we've said before, that the other can only exist insofar as he can be conceptualized through the subject position, through mankind, as being non-contradictory, as being finite, as, in fact, tending men, man towards a limit by trying to objectify himself. And in fact, really, this is just reason believing in itself, which we can say is man's self-affirmation objectifying itself as an object outside of itself. So in a sense, Feuerbach sees impregnated within religion, humanism itself. He says that religion as postulating a God outside of man is actually failing to see that the religious impulse is the desire of the affirmation of mankind. In terms of getting to the essence of Christianity, the title of this book, he specifically wants to look at some of the revolutions that Christianity specifically can lay hold of. And he wants to, in fact, glean from them what is due. He thinks that, in fact, for example, the idea that God is love is the greatest thing Christianity has ever come up with. He thinks that this is the exaltation of the human spirit itself, that God becoming man is showing us that, in fact, God is man, that God is man affirming himself. And he wants to bring out the central idea of love. If you know anything about the Bible, for example, you'll know, and specifically if you're familiar with Christianity, you'll know that it is often talked about the old law versus the new law. And the old law is that of the Old Testament when Jesus hadn't come yet, and it was typically seen as harsher and unforgiving. Whereas the new law is where Jesus comes to die for your sins, and all you have to do is accept him, and that's it. It's by grace alone, no works needed, although works help. And even that is a contention among Christians we're not even going to begin to get into. But the important thing about that idea of salvation by grace alone, that Jesus just dies for you, is very interesting when we start to think about the fact that God must become man. And it is man sacrificing himself for mankind out of love, which is a great impulse, right? And it's a great action. Now, of course, there's this duality and really this contradiction, but we're not even going to get into it, of Jesus being both man and God at the same time. But regardless, Feuerbach says, love makes me aware that I am human. The law only makes me aware that I am a sinner and that I am worthless. The law subjects man to himself. Love makes him free. Love makes man divine and it makes God human. Which is to say, I mean, just as there's the Bible verse that love shall set you free. In fact, love, the divine love, is what makes God become man such that he can do this act of forgiving man. Because, of course, he's talking about the law in a very pejorative fashion. That it makes me aware I'm a sinner and that I'm worthless and debases man. Where he thinks, whereas he thinks that this loving impulse is an exaltation of man. Even in the idea of Jesus, man is exalted as divine and he is both simultaneously. And in fact, this is what Feuerbach thinks that men are, that mankind is divinity itself. Divinity is not something outside of mankind, but rather mankind itself. And it's important to note, Feuerbach is not an atheist. He is specifically a, I don't know, you could call him some kind of mystic humanist of some kind, a religious humanist of some kind. He thinks that this impulse of the divine is real. He thinks the emanation 
of the divine as an objective real being standing outside of mankind is the issue. And he goes on to really explain exactly the ontological necessity of Jesus, not as being an independent being, but in fact showing us to the core of our drive to love our fellow humans. He says, a merely moral judge who does not infuse human blood into his judgment judges the sinner relentlessly and without forgiveness. Therefore, by regarding God as a sin-pardoning being, God is posited not indeed as an immoral, but as a not merely moral, as a more than moral, in a word, as a human being. The annulling of sin is the annulment of abstract moral righteousness and recognition of love, mercy, and sensuous life. Not abstract beings, no. Only sensuous, living beings are merciful. Mercy is the justice of sensuous life. Hence, it is not God as the abstract God of the intellect, but God as man, God as God made flesh. God is a physical being who finds in himself forgiveness for the sins of men. This God-man, it is true, does not sin, but he knows and takes upon himself the sufferings, the wants, and the agony of sensuous beings. The blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins in the eyes of God, for it is only his human blood that makes God merciful and allays his anger. And the really interesting concept of... The God-man is really interesting because it, in fact, posits or shows this idea that to talk about divinity is really a tautology. It's this, you know, if, if this is one being, right, that, that's what the, the dash here is for, that this is one being, the God-man, not God and man, not man and God, not them separate, but God-man. This shows, in fact, that man talking about God, I mean, it's like one going back to one, right? It's a strict tautology, which is to say that, in fact, what is really being gotten at here is that he doesn't sin, right? The God-man doesn't sin. And this, is, this is what Jesus is supposed to be that he doesn't sin, yet nevertheless, he takes the burden of others on his hand. And this is considered as something only the divine being could do. But if the divine being is man talking about himself, then rather what this is expressing is the desire for man to love his fellow men, for mankind to love itself, and we could say that this is selfish because it's a being loving itself in a sense. And maybe that's the case. And maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing within a Hegelian framework where objective being is tautology. In this sense, morality is a tautology. It's mankind caring for himself because mankind loves himself, loving himself kind of thing. So in fact, this impulse is the need not to separate these terms, but to bring them together and to show their self-sameness. In one of the more driven quotes throughout the work, he wants us to focus on this exaltation of the love of mankind to mankind or humankind to humankind. And he sort of wants to get rid of this middleman that we think we need God as an objective, independent being to talk about love. He thinks that, again, within a Hegelian framework, the external, independent being is only qua the subject's emanation of that being, like we talked about earlier. It's tautology. So this, this middleman is necessary, and this is probably why he keeps the divine language, but he in fact wants to recognize that the divine is a self-emanation. And thus he says, who then is our savior and redeemer, God or love? 
love. And as God has renounced himself out of love, so we out of love should renounce God. For if we do not sacrifice God to love, we sacrifice love to God. And in spite of his predicate of love, we have the God, the evil being of religious fanaticism. And this is to say that if we use God as the surrogate, as the way to which, I mean, really, surrogate is a wonderful thing because, or a wonderful way to talk about this, because if we have the subject, which is really just humankind, and then we have love, we want to posit this love as an independent existence. But like we said before, because the subject is within his little box, which I won't draw again, the love can only be understood as, right, you'll see this Hegel diagram all the time if you read like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something like that, that the subject's desire for love is in fact love's desire for the subject. In fact, it, right, this is tautological in the strictest sense and thus mankind's love for himself. And as such, he says, if we want to really love, we have to recognize this tautology and say that it's humankind loving humankind, right? That it's not an independent existence, but in fact, one which is within humankind. And if we objectify love, again, in the twofold sense of realizing it as an object, of making it an object, and also of debasing it to an object, we merely bring love outside of ourselves. And really we can see, even within the Hegelian framework, this is basically just taking the arrow one way and forgetting that it goes back the other way. Or maybe this is taking the arrow this way, taking it back and saying, oh, this love is, and even though I know it as being my understanding of love, still this love is an independent thing. If we're in a Hegelian framework, this motion, this, this is rationality, right? This arrow is rationality. It's the driving teleological force that is driving dialectical sublation and the subject and love are going to be brought together. Even Hegel in the Phenomenology of Spirit, in the last kind of large chapter where he's talking about religion, basically says that this is what Jesus is, that it is this dialectical sublation which brings humankind or man and love together. And that really love is this impulse driving them together. And Feuerbach says, okay, if that's the case, then love is not an independent being. It is ultimately diced, right? We like to think that this is geist and this is geist's negation, not geist. But in fact, Hegel says that through this negation and through this dialectical sublation that will result from the appearance of negation, because Hegel says that the appearance of negation will self-negate that which is being negated, he says that this is going to bring about the realization that everything is geist. Because even the not geist is geist insofar as it is defined by geist as being the opposition to geist and thus having a being only in reference to geist. So thus, if everything is absolute spirit and thus ultimately tautological, then the love and mankind are in fact emanations of the same thing, of man with a capital M, so to speak. And thus, if we externalize love in the divine being, we separate it from ourselves and we turn ourselves into fanatics. But if we realize that this impetus that creates love, in fact, is love being internalized further and being reflected upon through Zepp's through self-consciousness, 
In fact, we see that love is something within humanity. It's not some independent thing. Just like here, this is the subject and this is not subject. It only has being insofar as it is an emanation of the subject. He says, if the object of God's love is man, is not then man in God an object to himself? If God is love, and if the essential object of this love is man, is not then the inner essence of the divine being human nature? Is not then the love of God for man, the kernel and center of religion, the love of man for himself, objectified and recognized as the highest objective truth, as the highest realization of human nature? Is not then the proposition God loves man an orientalism, which means in plain speech, there is nothing higher than man's love for man? And this is a wonderful thing that rather beautifully sums up what we've been, been talking about before, which is to say, if love is the object, that which is being objectified and made as an independent being, is an object for mankind and a negation of mankind, right, as not guys, as not subject, doesn't that mean that this is ultimately man being his own object through objectifying his nature outside of himself and thus bringing it back to him in a grand tautology? Thus, he thinks that ultimately all the things that we place into God and make as the law with the capital L are in fact mankind or humankind's own laws for itself. And thus, in a properly ethical way, not properly as in correct, but as in essentially ethical, he wants to say that Ethics does not point outside of humankind to the transcendent, but rather that shows that the transcendent is humankind's own attempt to transcend or realize its value. And maybe transcend isn't even the right word because it, we don't want man's, mankind to transcend beyond his values. Because in fact, we see by doing this, this is just bringing mankind back to its own values. And thus, it is pure affirmation of humankind. Now, this is where we have to be careful that we not overstep exactly what Feuerbach is trying to say. Because there are cases where you can read him and it's like, oh, he's an anti-theist. He is calling God pure imagination. This is the kind of thing that, of course, he is saying that in a sense. But in a sense, within the Hegelian framework, for something to be pure tautology, pure self-imagination, this is not necessarily a bad thing. And of course, we can talk about how this is a sort of an issue in Hegelian philosophy itself. But nevertheless, the point is he is not trying to exile divinity to nothing, but to bring divinity back into the real and to show how the divinity is none other than the real. He says the only difference between the course of religion and the course taken by men who rely on nature and reason is thus. The natural man travels in a straight line because it is the shortest, whereas religion travels in a circle. In religion, man rejects himself only to posit himself again in a glorified form and he rejects his life here and now, but only to posit it again in the end as the life hereafter. Religion thus arrives, though by a circuit, at the very goal toward which the natural man hastens in a straight line. To live in projected dream images is the essence of religion. Religion sacrifices reality to the projected dream. The beyond is merely the here reflected in the mirror of imagination. It's important to realize, and this is something you'll get with Hegel, is even when Hegel talks about something that he disagrees with or that is the opposite of what he's postulated, he wants to grab something from both of them 
he wants to have his cake and eat it too, which we can talk about how much of a problem that is. But nevertheless, it is interesting to have this Hegelian framework in mind and realize that he thinks that the man who relies on nature and reason, the one who travels in a straight line to his goals, is partially true. But so is the religious circuit, as he calls it. Really, the tautology, right? It's an infinite, an infinite regress of just postulating these same two terms over and over in a circle. He thinks that, okay, we've got, let's call it natural man, as he calls it, throughout the work. And then we have, let's just call it the pious man, the, the one who is religious. For the natural man, he goes from the self to the yet to be in a straight line. He says that, okay, I am finite and this is not necessarily infinite, but more so beyond finite. And if I want to get to this beyond, I should use nature and I should use reason and I should try to come to this through, you know, logical processes. Whereas the pious man, he's basically engaging in self-recognition. And self-recognition is a big thing in Hegelian philosophy. Essentially, one engages in rejection, and this allows man to reject himself as finite, like we've talked about before. And this spawns the idea of finitude as being a demeaning thing. I am a mere man. I am merely finite. I am, an, I am a sinner. I am inherently evil and base. This is the rejection that spawns the postulating of God, postulating the beyond finite as something which is ahead of oneself, but in so doing allows for recognition, right? Because then God will affirm you as a pious man as a subject who has done as they should, who is truly a child of God and going to his kingdom. And this recognition can be called a number of things, but we could call it grace, or we could call it love. So this, re this rejection of the self to go beyond the self is the precondition to make one's aims something realizable, something which is not in the future necessarily, but which is already, because thus this rejection of oneself allows the object that is outside of oneself to recognize this self and to allow it to be immediately. In a sense, when one, for example, is a Christian, and accepts God and accepts Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, they are immediately born again, right? They're exalted and they are immediately now a child of God. Their, their fate is now in the hereafter. So we can see in a sense, this yet to be is still within the naturalistic framework, even within kind of a religious framework who takes count of nature, they say, okay, my yet to be is ahead of me. But this yet to be can either be death or it can be heaven. And we want it to be heaven. We want this yet to be good and to be things that we value and things that we want. And thus, this postulation, this need to have our wants be outside of us, prompts us to reject ourselves in an effort to realize these goods and these values 
and thus to have them fold back in on us. And Feuerbach says, look, this beyond is merely the here. It is being postulated as something beyond. But in fact, if this is the case, and this is the paradigm, then in fact, the realization of one's goals is immediately in front of them through love and grace, immediately through the mediation of the divine. But if the divine is the self, qua self, it's its own emanation, then in fact you show through this, that in fact all these things that we postulate as being ahead of us are actually within us. And this is merely an attempt to realize our values and objectify them and make them real in kind of a final exaltation of mankind itself. Feuerbach says, a necessary consequence of this contradiction, the contradiction between man and his values, which are outside of himself and are postulated as an objective being, but there, thereby become his own being reflected within itself. A necessary consequence of this contradiction is atheism. The existence of God is supposed to be an empirical existence, and yet it has none of the distinctive marks of an empirical existence. It calls upon man to seek it in the realm of reality. It impregnates his mind with sensational conceptions and expectations. Hence, when these are not fulfilled, when, on the contrary, man finds that experience does not agree with these conceptions, he is perfectly justified in denying that existence. And this represents a great thrust in atheism, which we can see today, which is there is the Bible verse, you know, knock and the door shall be opened which is to say that our dealings in reality, in the here and now, can actually find God. And he says, look, if we want to think of God as something we can access through reality, and we knock, and we use reason, and we find that this objective existence is not so, it is therefore valid to reject even what God represents as being something objective and outside of oneself, that oneself being humankind, but rather something within it. And thus, Feuerbach represents an exaltation of reality for reality's sake, so to speak, humankind for humankind's sake. This represents a great stride between the kind of Christian-dominated paradigm of Western philosophy to this shift out of Hegelianism through left Hegelianism towards dialectical materialism and eventually towards structuralism and post-structuralism and the postmodern as really representing something which, in fact, Feuerbach does. This, ex this uh, exaltation of reality, of not trying to postulate the transcendent, but as seeing that impetus as something within reality itself, this is something even Deleuze and Guattari want to do. And thus, this is a great little work to pick up because there's a lot of stuff I didn't mention where he is basically rationalizing the stuff that may seem quite arbitrary in Christianity, explaining exactly why it is how it is and how this can orient us towards a sort of secular humanism. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you'll check out some of my other ones, especially on Hegel, if this was a little confusing to you. And I'll see you in another lecture.